morning. I'm not gonna make any promises first thing today. There's the 10 day forecast. I don't think I need to even do any explaining on what's on my mind right now. I'm penciling in probably Tuesday at the earliest, Wednesday at the latest. That is a green light for full speed planning. If we miss this shower on Friday and they don't add anything to the forecast, we very well could have most of our seed in the ground by next Sunday, the Sunday after this Sunday, which is Easter. My dad says it does not matter what happens as long as it does not rain on Easter Sunday. That's some kind of bad omen. I'm not familiar with that logic, but I've heard it from many people. A rain on Easter Sunday is not good. A good omen is that our Hagee has been moved. No, it's not that one. That's a different one. It was parked right here. That means that either A, they're working on it now and going to have it available to us soon, or B, they know I've been checking in on it almost every morning on my way to work, so they moved it, so I think that they were making progress. Although I would say everything happens for a reason, I'm not going to apply to this situation. It may be a blessing in disguise that we got that rain on Wednesday because I would be fairly behind on my spraying obligations if we had started planning on Wednesday as opposed to getting that rain. We would still be running hard today. That's what we're fighting off right now is the residual moisture and dampness in the soil from that half inch to six tenths of an inch rainfall we got. It won't take long, as long as it warms up and the sun shines, for that to be out and it's time to hit the ground running. Speaking of spraying, I ran all that water through my tanker yesterday and I did not purge my pump drain valve when I was done at the end of the day. Last night the temperatures got down to 33, I believe was the lowest it got anywhere. I'm slightly concerned that I may have just ruined my brand new pump though. It's probably unlikely, especially because I don't think the temperatures even hit freezing, technically speaking. I guess we'll cross that bridge when it comes. Hopefully I didn't waste a bunch of money there. When I get my hands on that Hagee, probably the beginning of next week, assuming they pump it through the shop fast enough, I am going to do some test loading and test spraying. If not on a field, definitely out here on the farm lot, just with some water. That's just to learn how to run the sprayer a little bit better before I load any kind of hot products in there. And I guess now to see if I ruined my pump or not. Anyways, that's a topic for a different day. Today, we're gonna do one of the more impressive equipment shuffles of the year. We gotta get the other two tillage implements hooked up and out of the barn. We got the new field cultivator out the other day, diagnosed some issues on that. It's ready to go. I was very serious when I said last Wednesday, we were planning on working ground that afternoon if it did not rain. Fortunately, it did rain, not only because I didn't have the sprayer, also because we had some problems with this unfolding. If you want more info on that, check out the last video. Pretty straightforward stuff here, nothing complicated. I just have a lot of equipment to move out of the way to get what I need done. First thing we're going to drag out is the 2660 John Deere vertical tillage device. We will not hook that up with the 9620. We're planning on doing permanent connections right now, meaning we're not gonna pull these out and unhook them because there's so many hydraulic lines and cables that plug into the back, we don't really want to play the unhook hook up all the time because it takes a little bit more of a trained operator to do that. We're going to do our best to hook everything up and put it back in the shed, which is easier said than done. Unfortunately, I did not plan ahead. The tractor I need for this is at the other shed. That's okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to back out the DB60 and the exact emerge planner, make some room and then run and get the other tractor. Okay, both tractors are out of the way somewhat. Got enough room to get the tillage implement and tractor through there. I'm gonna run over to the other shed and get the four-wheel drive tractor that I need to get that 2660 out. I had Chris open these doors for me. I probably should have had him go ahead and start this tractor so it'd be warm by now. I'm gonna wait a second, let it build up some engine temperature because it got a little chilly last night. I've already mentioned that a time or two. Since we're trying to keep everything hooked up, space is going to become a constraint very quickly in the other shed. Dad and I think it may be possible to pull the vertical till into this shed hooked up. 
that would gain us a lot of room. We may also go ahead and hook up those seed tenders and drag them out, open up some room over there for maybe the backhoe and one of these extra utility tractors. We'll have to figure that one out as the situation develops just because we're not even sure if the 2660 will fit in here. I told Chris and Jeff to go ahead and move those tractors and the mower out of the way because we're planning on relocating the seed tenders regardless of whether or not this fits in there now that I think about it. We've got multiple guard dogs and children out here saying goodbye as the tractor leaves. See everyone. Hey Chassie. With all this stuff slated to be outside, today would be a great day for an equipment tour because I haven't done one of those in a few years. I just don't have my sprayer and I feel like a tour of planting season would be a miss without the sprayer because it is very pivotal to your success. We gotta back this in and then do a little three-point shimmy, straighten out, and then come in at an angle here on the 2660. That way it's pretty easy to pull out. It sure was snug. That's one of those times where you really could use access to the north door on the shed because we have to really cut it hard to get this out and then get it out the door. I'm just gonna park this here in the drive and then go get the other cultivator out with the 9620 and then I'll play with all the true set stuff assuming it's gonna work. Time to hook the big tractor up to its field cultivator. We've got it 90% of the way hooked up. Jeff's finishing up the safety chain right now. Notice that in the ISO connection, there's plenty of dirt because we don't use the ISO for the disc ripper in the fall. And I imagine all that loose fine powder that comes up in the air worked its way into here. So I had Chris run me over to my truck to get my electrical contact cleaner. We are now going to clean it out because I would imagine the TrueSet system wouldn't like that since it didn't even like a dirty seven pin, a dirty ISO connection is probably even worse got the straw on here so maybe that'll put enough force behind it to yeah. clean it out. Blow it in our face. Yeah. Close your eyes. I don't know if this stuff would stay but I would imagine yeah. it does. <laughs> I mean, this is what you need to clean up your sinuses. You want a huff of this? No. The contact cleaner? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty close, I think. Yeah. We only use half the can. Well, hopefully, it hooks up now. All sorts of. Look right up. There we go. I definitely went in. And if I do that the right way, you let go of it. <coughs> I guess it's not going anywhere. No.
I've got a real logistical nightmare developing here in the farm lot. Everything's parked a different direction. You can't even really get around the place. Since we had trouble with the other field cultivator unfolding, that is the first thing I'm going to check. Oh, look at that. Flawless execution of the setup by me. I should have enough width here to do this all. If not, Chris is going to be taking a ride to the hospital. We must be all right because he doesn't seem too concerned. I took this tractor's second monitor, the extended one that was down in the corner here. I probably ought to go ahead and make sure that they have access to a screen that can run the true set stuff. Okay, I've got my layout manager open. Now I just need to find the appropriate software thing to put up here. It says I'm not going to have enough space, so I need to do some housekeeping. I changed a few settings around and it asked me to restart the tractor. So we should be ready to rock and roll here. I've got my true set page here. This is all the tillage stuff. Most of you are familiar with it. The fuel cultivators are very simple. There's two things that matter. The depth, which is labeled as shanks, and the basket down pressure. Got all of our presets down here, so if I want to run up to inch and a half, 300, it'll move. Of course, if it's not lit up, that means the system is not active. For it to be active, I need to put the tractor in drive and detent the number one lever. I'll do that real quick and show you. Tractor's in drive. If I click this, it went to yellow. Yellow indicates that it is in the middle stage, I guess the ready stage. Once it senses that the tractor is moving, it will actually go down to that level. If we want to go to three with 550 pounds of downforce, hit that button or that button for two and a half, 550. It keeps kicking off just because I'm not moving, but then you can play with it. Go deeper if you need to. I've got it on half inch increments. Most of the tillage we'll do is probably going to be two and a half inches deep. As for deferred maintenance on this field cultivator, which is a couple years old, we got it last year for the first time, new to us, but used. It really does not have near as many grease irks as the older models do. We may need to check the wheel bearings. Everything else is either a sealed bearing or it has a nylon wear strip in it, meaning that you don't have to grease it. We do our best to get our money's worth out of our sweeps. Before we put this away last summer, we changed all of the sweeps we thought needed replaced. You can see a few brand new freshly painted ones here. The rusty ones have been through the dirt. Doesn't take a new one very long to look like one of these other ones. They all shine up once they get used and continue to wear. We run seven inch sweeps on these quick change system so we just use the little lever and the hammer we can knock them off looks like we're going to be good to go though it doesn't take very long like i said to have to change them we may be hopping under this thing in the first two days to put new ones on just because they wear very quickly you guys will all recall that we fully serviced this tractor greased everything change the oil change the filters there is one thing that we forgot to do or just haven't done yet and that is grease the drive shaft which involves climbing under the tractor not really climbing slithering is a better word and greasing that you have to get it lined up so it's really a two-person job i'll wait till my dad shows up maybe he'll volunteer to do that before i do any manual labor i'm going to get in the 9460r and see whether or not i got the 2660 hooked up i have noticed that both implements we just hooked up probably have room for some air in their tires which isn't something i think we'll do today because to get them over to the other shed where the big air compressor is we have to go through the yard a little bit and the yards are it's kind of soft and it doesn't take an expert to know that these tillage implements put a lot of weight on the ground. A lot of weight in a soft yard equals a very gross mess. This one won't be as fun or exciting because we got the old 2630 display in here running true set. Should unfold. A little stubborn, I think it was in a nice relaxed position. Takes a little wiggling of the hydraulics to get it to go. Oh, it's taking its sweet time, that's for sure. There you go, 10 minutes later it's unfolded. This monitor is what I had on my planter tractor for years. It's set up right now to run planting type stuff. Huh, well, that was completely wrong there. I thought I was gonna have to come in here and program this and get the layout all corrected to run this, but it looks to me like it's ready to go. Got all of our true set settings here. You can see this vertical till has a lot more going on, especially because you can adjust the angle of the gangs, four and a half tilt, and put wing down force on it. Everything seems to be in working shape. I'll pop it into gear real quick, flick the lever, and see if it's going to go into intermediate stage. Same deal. I can put it in drive, and if I click one down, those should all light up. Looks like they did. Four and a half will not light up because it's not plugged in. We've determined that four and a half is the least important of the five remotes. We only have four remotes on this tractor, and we didn't think it was worth the expense to plug that extra one in. 
usually fore and aft doesn't get adjusted a whole lot during the season, so we just don't have it plugged in. If we wanted to adjust fore and aft, we would actually have to go out there, switch one of the things out, put it in there, manually adjust it, then unplug it. I hate to point this out because like they say, people with glass houses shouldn't throw stones. The two true set tillage implements that I hooked up personally, flawless. No issues unfolding, pretty much ready to go other than airing up tires once I pull them out of the barn. The brand new fuel cultivator that my dad hooked up by himself, well, it had problems. Evidence is pretty clear. I'm not gonna talk about any more than that. There's a lot of John Deere equipment parked out on our lot right now. And I mean a lot. People probably think we're getting ready for the sale. I guess while I have everything out here, I'll give everyone a quick refresher course on the purpose of our tillage implements. This 2230 floating hitch field cultivator is the same thing as that brand new one over there. They will both be running in tandem to work all of our corn and soybean stocks before the planters. They provide a fresh level seed bed as well as removing any weeds that are out there. The 2660 VT or vertical tillage device there is a more unique tool in the spring. You could definitely do field prep work with it if you wanted and I know a lot of farmers that are doing so. It's got the double rolling baskets on the back so it can produce a relatively good seed bed. I will argue that it cannot do as good of a job as this field cultivator here, though it's close enough that you really could cut down on expense and replace your field cultivators with this fall tillage tool that really does two things at once. The one area where these field cultivators lack that the 2660 doesn't is when it comes to working through areas with a lot of weeds. These field cultivators are not mulch finishers. A mulch finisher is basically a field cultivator with a disc gang on the front. The disc on the front allow everything coming in to be cut up a little more. When you're just working bare soil, you really don't need it to be cut up because the soil will fall apart as it goes through the sweeps. That's their job. The drag chain hero knocks down clods, levels it out a little bit more, and the rolling basket with the hydraulic downforce provides a nice smooth finish out the back. The lack of ability to control weeds with this is why we have this 2660 hooked up. Usually we don't deal with a ton of overgrowth in the spring unless we get pushed back really late. Sometimes we'll choose chemical control methods over mechanical methods like tillage if it gets bad enough. We like to keep it hooked up though in case there's a unique circumstance. And if we get really far behind on tillage, we could probably run that ahead of the bean planter. We want our best soil finish ahead of the corn planter. It also covers the most ground, so it will get priority from both field cultivators. The problem though, is that our math is not gonna add up correctly here. These two planters will be able to outplant these two field cultivators. We'll have to figure that out as the situation develops this spring, but it will give me an opportunity in the soybean planter, which is less of a priority, to maybe hop out and run the sprayer a little bit if I need to. Either way, I'm confident that we have more than enough equipment and capacity to get the job done in a quality manner. When it comes to spring tillage tools, it's kind of hit or miss. Most guys in the area run a field cultivator, though I have seen a lot of guys that run the mulch finisher, which like I said, field cultivator with a disc gang on the front. The only drawback to that is that some people don't like the idea of a disc in the spring. They say it creates an additional compaction layer as well as adding weight to your equipment and slowing down your tillage overall because it has horsepower requirement. I'm not gonna argue though that those mulch finishers don't do a phenomenal job. I know plenty of people who use them. They do produce a very good finish. One thing I've started to notice lately is a lot of people running those 2660s in the spring and the fall. I think it has a lot to do with what I just mentioned, the price point, being able to eliminate an expensive tillage tool like this. This is probably a $150,000 field cultivator brand new. Well, this one's used. That one was around $150,000 brand new. This 2660 isn't much cheaper. You can get them up to 49 foot. They say though that 44 foot's about the biggest you can get to pull them fast. Speed matters with vertical tillage and it doesn't hurt with field cultivators as well. I've already stated my personal opinion that I think a field cultivator or a mulch finisher leaves you a better product than a vertical till will. That's not to say that there isn't an economic decision to be made there. If you think that you can make better use of your assets by having one tool that can work in the spring and the fall, it's definitely justifiable. You see, I got everything lined up out here. This would be a perfect time for an equipment tour. I don't have the sprayer. I'm not gonna do it without it. Oh, let's see if we can get lucky and get the drive shaft grease without having to move the tractor. Nope. 
Not our lucky day today, I don't think. I've inspected the older fuel cultivator and the vertical till. It definitely looks like we fully serviced those, greased everything, even the wheel bearings, before we put it away. They're pretty much in field condition. I need to check one thing on the new fuel cultivator that someone warned me about in the comment section. I also need to hop into Dad's tractor and just check that his GPS offsets and row shutoff timings have not changed from last year. I want to make sure those are dialed in. Of course, we've already taken my planner out to the field and done that kind of work. Once you have those numbers established, you can just reuse them the next year, assuming they don't change. That's why I need to double check. We've had dads change before and had some issues in the field with gaps and overlaps. So we wanna make sure that's not done. It's hard to explain to people that you could have prevented the accident from happening just by getting in the cab and flipping to a different page and making sure numbers didn't magically change on their own. I'm gonna run into the John Deere dealership to talk to the technicians about a few things, including my Hagee that they're working on right now. Fortunately, I left myself a little lane to get through our John Deere maze. I'll check back in with y'all later. I'm just pulling back into the farm after running to the John Deere dealership, then going home, eating lunch, and maybe taking a 10 or 15 minute nap. But I'm not gonna admit to that part. Someone warned me in the comments about the new field cultivator that they received one that did not have any grease in the wheel bearings. It looked like that one had been greased, so I went and talked to the setup mechanic. He said that that is a part of the setup process. The mechanic who set that up did in fact grease it. It's also the same guy who set up the DB60, does good work. It sounds like that particular person who had that issue probably needs to talk to their dealership not to deer in general. It's hard saying with some things what falls on corporate deer in the factories and what falls on your dealership because everyone has different responsibilities when it comes to setting up new equipment. Ironically, the same gentleman was also looking over my Hagee. He's not a qualified Hagee mechanic, so all the plumbing and booms and stuff are probably out of his area of expertise. Not that he's not a good mechanic, but sprayers are a completely different beast than tillage, tractors, combines, all that. He was changing the oil, doing the simple stuff. The main Hagee tech is supposed to be looking at it soon, getting a checklist and either fixing what's broken or at least earmarking that so I can take the sprayer at the beginning of next week and start spraying and then once I slow down, they'll take it back and fix everything. One thing I forgot to mention when I was talking about the pros and cons of different type of tillage in the spring, a lot of people don't like discs, especially vertical tillage discs because they do not handle damp soil very well. I'm not saying that I would recommend working any soil if it's too wet, but if I had to pick something, it would be the field cultivator. Vertical tillage discs and any disc gang in general make slabs. They're not very good at dispersing that soil. That's why if you're working less than ideal conditions, you probably don't want something like this. So that is one con to replacing multiple tillage devices with just one. You can't ever have anything that's perfect at everything. It's kind of like a Swiss Army knife. It's going to be okay at a lot of things, but not great at any one single thing. Looks like Dad's in his planter truck for messing around with something. Dad said he confirmed all the GPS offsets and row shutoffs, so he's going around setting his planter unit depth and closing the pressure, and I'm going to do the same real quick. Just getting these somewhat within reason, we can adjust it when we get to the field and see how conditions are and what the units are actually putting out. I haven't decided on individual row hydraulic downforce targets. On the old planter, I usually shot for 250 to 300 pounds if I was no-tilling into a stale seed bed. If I'm planting into work ground, it'll be a lot softer. So I may shoot for something like 150 to 100 pounds. Then again, I'm also planning on putting the coals to it, so maybe up that a little bit. I wanna make sure at the bare minimum that my rows stay against the ground as I'm going across the field. You do wanna avoid putting too much weight on them because you could create sidewall compaction. My rear view camera needs adjusted upwards a little bit. It's looking down too much. I can't see behind me as well. Pretty simple adjustment though. 
seems to me like we're pretty much ready to rock and roll with the meat and potatoes of planting season. Once we get everything tucked back in the barn, assuming it'll fit, we're gonna go get the seed tenders out and at least reposition them so they're staged and easy to get to. We like to try and get things into a position where one person can hook onto them and move them out where they're parked right now in their winter storage position. You might need a second set of eyes, so we'll go ahead and move those. Please don't hit my planter. If there's anyone on the farm I trust to not hit something, it's my dad. At the same time, you just never know with him. Alrighty, let's try and stuff all of this back in the shed. If it doesn't work, well, we'll figure it out. You don't win any awards for backing up quickly. You do lose a lot of awards for backing into things. So keep that in mind when you're going backwards on the farm. Hurry it up and spot for me, boss man. Yeah, no editing required. That was one try. Straight back in the corner. That must be why they pay me the big bucks. Looks like we should be able to squeeze the smaller tractor in there, Dad. We still only got that one tractor back then. Before we put everything else away, we're going to bring our DEF tank and pump over to the fuel tank because we figured we might as well top off the DEF on the DEF burners before we put them in the shed because next time they come out, it's probably going to be go time. I chose the good job here. This over, I think Dad and Chris are going to move out at least one of those seed tenders. Just gonna drop this off and run back and help them with the tenders. It would be nice to upgrade to a big 250 plus gallon tote that has an area underneath to slide prongs in. Just moving barrels around is kind of for birds. I'd like to do that with our oil as well. That'll do for now. This amount of depth will last us longer in the spring than it would in the fall. In the fall, we've got two combines and a grain cart tractor burning depth along with the 9620 if it's doing tillage at the same time. That quad stack goes through a lot. We've just got one planter tractor and one tillage tractor in the spring running it. Though that 9620 can do a lot. I guess Jeff's not helping this afternoon. He's mowing his yard. Dad summoned me back over here to pick the depth tank up again. Don't really know. Communication is obviously not a strong suit. I'm not really sure what the goal is here. It looks like we're gonna directly fill into the 370 tractor. It's almost halfway as good as a Thunder Creek. Very viable strategy here we're working with. Are we storing this tank somewhere else or what's the plan? No. You just didn't want to take the tractor around to the tank to fill it up? Yeah. Huh, I guess that makes sense. I'm not sure how I ever in a million years would have figured this game plan out without a tally point. It had nothing to do with putting this barrel in the wrong spot. It was in the right spot. He just didn't want to have to move all the tractors around to fill them up. So just doing the express route right now. Dad and the dog are playing defense against my nephew. This is what it's like working with Marty some days, all over the place. Didn't finish backing that seed tender in because I'm gonna do some servicing on it. We're back over at the main shed, putting the tractors in. there is not enough for that big four-wheel drive tractor. Just shows you how wide its stance is. This is a lot of real estate to watch. I told him to pull his baskets up. That should help a little bit. They're not up! There you go! Okay, this is gonna be tight. 
or we're gonna put this one in a different spot. I really have no idea, folks. Okay, an additional executive decision was made. My dad said, we'll just leave the 9460R and the new field cultivator parked outside. Only gonna be three, maybe four days before we're actually doing some tillage and the weather's supposed to be fairly nice. So not that big of a deal. We're just gonna leave it out and pull two planters in and then we'll be done at the shed. Chris and I are back at the red shed, servicing the seed tenders. We did a oil change and battery checkup a couple weeks ago. I'm not gonna get anything done if I don't get that cobweb off. Got one low tire on the cord seed tender. We need to fire it up, run the conveyor, and grease everything. There's not really a whole lot of grease irks on this thing. It just doesn't get a lot of TLC once we start planting. And once we're done planting, we usually put them away. My goal this year is to actually wash them off before we're done. Yeah, whopping 7 PSI in this one. You may have to go to the tire shop. Don't take long. Shooting for 70 pounds. While that airs up, I'm going to go ahead and fire up this seed tender. Make sure everything's going to run correctly. And like I said, grease it. Sounds like the battery's dead. My dad said it was perfectly charged. Who needs a battery when you got a full start? I left the seed tinder running because the battery was dead. I need to grease it, but before I can grease it, I need to replace the worn out tip on my Milwaukee gun that has this lock and loop fitting. I guess they wear out occasionally. And it says you pretty much just twist this end piece off. I've had this for long enough now that I can't recall if I bought this extra one or if it came with it. All grease gun tips do wear out eventually. It doesn't matter if they're more dynamic like this one or if they're simpler like a, just a regular metal tip. Wear and tear adds up on them. Oh boy, there's some assembly required with this one. You may or may not need some kind of advanced training to do this. Okay, worst we can do is go try it out. It's been running for about five minutes. I doubt that really charged the battery at all. I guess it worked. These lock and loop fittings are pretty slick when they work. I guess it was just worn out, so I had to replace it. A little more. Back. Yeah, back. Each barely. Whoa! Pretty good, Chris. First try. The Ember Perth is seven, eight, nine, maybe ten years older than this thing. A lot of innovations and quality of life improvements in seat tenders in that time period.
Alrighty folks, that's the end of the line for me today. Planting season is so close, you can almost taste it. We're practically counting down the minutes until we're out starting to do some field work. Because busy season is going to be kicking off very shortly, Ali, Lenny, and I are gonna go to the movies tonight, enjoy ourselves a little bit, go see the new Mario movie. To answer your question, no, not my choice, but I never turned down a good movie. As always, everyone, I greatly appreciate you continuing to tune in and support the channel. Your viewership means the world to me. I'll catch you all in the next episode. Until then, make sure you like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you wanna see more, and comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day, everyone. Peace.